Hi, I'm Chris Mamazellas here in Australia, the great southern land, and you only need to look behind me to realise how lucky we are to live in this beautiful country. We live in a democracy where we have a say on who and how we are governed. We even have the opportunity to run for parliament, although it hasn't always been this way. And you don't have to look far to see people all around the world that are prepared to put their lives on the line to live under some sort of democracy. In fact, there's only ever been two periods of history where the people have claimed democracy as their form of government. Once in ancient Greece, two and a half thousand years ago, and only a handful of countries over the past 200 years. Australia is regarded as one of the most progressive democracies in the world. And as I sit here and enjoy the serenity of Sydney Harbour, there's a gentle reminder of a colonial past which was anything but a democracy. The catamaran ferries, for example, are all named after ships of the first fleet. And just across from where I'm standing is the area called the Rocks, which was the first convict settlement and where hangings and public floggings were a common occurrence. So in comparison, we really do live the good life. Before we go back and explore the democratic history of Australia, we need to go back much further, two and a half thousand years in fact, to the ancient Greeks. So why don't you come on a journey with me? We'll find out what democracy is and where it came from. The first step was to get some expert opinions from people like Associate Professor Stephen Stockwell, who is researching the history of democracy at Griffith University. Democracy is the rule of the people, essentially. That's you know, how it breaks down. And the word certainly comes from the uh, ancient Greek and you know, refers to the institutions of uh, places like Athens, uh, where the, uh, for a variety of internal political reasons, the people ended up taking control of the government themselves. The great ancient Greek historian Herodotus is the first to use the word demokratia to describe this new radical form of government. Yet there is growing archaeological evidence to suggest that democratic ideas existed before Athens. I mean, it's been interesting in the last uh, couple of years, I've uh, been doing more research about the development of democracy in the early city-states of uh, Ur and uh, you know, those Mesopotamian states, which are kind of relevant to the you know, introduction of democracy in uh, Iraq at the moment. This view is shared by Professor John Keane, who established the Centre for Democracy at Westminster University in London and sees democracy consisting of two phases. I think in this first phase of, of democracy, uh, democracy means self-government through the assembly. And assemblies are an Eastern invention. Uh, lots of archaeological evidence now is, a, is surfacing of uh, assemblies in the, the cities and also the countryside of Syria, Mesopotamia. And they get transported partly to the east, to what is today Pakistan and Western India. And they also get transported to the west. And they get picked up in the Hellenic world, where uh, particularly the Athenians claim demokratia as their own invention. By far the most complete and reliable evidence survives from ancient Athens in the fifth and fourth centuries BC. Not only is there a huge amount of archaeological evidence still being discovered, but completed texts still survive. Philosophies by Plato and Aristotle, histories by Herodotus, Plutarch and Thucydides, comedies and tragedies by Aristophanes, Sophocles, Euripides and Aeschylus. It's thanks to the Athenians that we have the best documented account of, of all the trimmings and trappings of democracy. And there the idea is that um, democracy is a, uh, a special, unusual kind of uh, polity where male citizens who consider themselves as equals, women are excluded, foreigners are excluded, slaves are not included, uh, that these male equals can gather in the paniques in the assembly and they can um, uh, put motions, they can debate them and they can agree by a show of hands or placing a piece of pottery in a jar, they can agree on uh, what's to be done. And uh, this was uh, an extraordinary invention. I wanted to find out more about ancient Greek democracy 
and how it compared to democracy today. So before I flew out to Athens, I interviewed Dr. David Pritchard from the Classics Department at Sydney University. The basic difference is that we have a representative form of democracy, whereas ancient Greece had a participatory form of democracy. So in our representative system, we elect representatives to conduct politics uh, on our behalf. This means that ordinary voters don't have uh, um, any role in the day-to-day -day conducting of politics and that often our only act political activity um, comes in the form of voting uh, or, um, in elections or uh, uh, in referendums. Uh, in classical Greece, by contrast, um, participants were involved in a very real way in day-to-day -day politics. Uh, they were able to turn up uh, to the regular meetings of the Assembly and the Council where public business was discussed. At those meetings they were free to um, speak themselves about political issues or what the city should do and they also voted on what the city should do itself. So they had a direct role in, uh, in the discussion of politics and also in political decision making. I finally made it to Athens and met my guide Gemma on top of one of the hills that surrounds the city. Gemma explained to me that the ancient Greeks had to adapt to the conditions around them. The mountainous terrain and lack of rainfall had forced them to develop intensive farming techniques where certain crops would flourish under these conditions. This led to long sea trade and the introduction of coinage. It developed a merchant class that became affluent and changed the dynamics within the city-states. Well, I think that Athens was the kind of town uh, that was made for democracy. It, it really depended to a large extent. Um, the power you know, was in the hands of traders um, and entrepreneurs of various uh, kinds. The uh, aristocrats who had um, been in power there, you know, hadn't adapted well to changing conditions. And I think this is one of the useful aspects of democracy all down its history is that, you know, it's very good at adapting to changing conditions. The Greeks settled into self-sufficient communities known as city-states. Their language, culture and religion bound them together and by the 8th century BC they managed to transform Millennia script from the Phoenicians and streamlined it by adding vowels to represent their language. It revolutionised the way people communicated as it allowed a permanent and accurate record that was universally understood within the Greek world. Uh, ordinary Athenians um, uh, perceived um, the possibility of democracy through slow political developments such as the introduction of matrices and the need for such, a, for such a development because of the bad behaviour of their upper class. Uh, in the course of the 6th century, um, members of that class were forever fighting with each other, hashing up public affairs, and getting themselves and ordinary people killed. And at, at the end of uh, uh, those shenanigans, uh, at the end of a century of shenanigans, ordinary Athenians said enough is enough and really it's a time that we're involved in public life because we feel that our involvement will ensure that public life is managed more successfully. The first thing that needed changing was the draconian laws that were extremely harsh and forced many Athenians into slavery. This was called debt bondage, where the farmers had to pay one-sixth of the produce to their landowners. It took a few key reformers to change all this. These reformers um, uh, or lawgivers in fact uh, had a significant impact on the direction that Athenian public life uh, took and really the first significant uh, figure of this sort is uh, the Athenian lawgiver Solon who was active in Athenian politics in the first half of the sixth century and he brought, brought in important laws which uh, meant that ordinary citizens were in a better financial situation. He outlawed debt bondage, for example, and also forms of debt which impacted negatively on the prosperity of ordinary citizens. He also strengthened laws about homicide, uh, introduced new laws, and instituted the first um, jury court in the city to facilitate uh, the decision, uh, um, the resolution of disputes through legal means as, uh, as opposed uh, to violence. Solon also divided the Athenian population into four census classes based on their ability to produce income from their land and their contribution to the military. Regardless, his reforms did not go far enough 
and Athens was taken over by a tyrant named Pisistratos. In the course of his reign as the tyrant, he introduces important reforms. So he encourages economic prosperity in, in the 6th century Athens. He also consolidates the institutions of the city, uh, um, such as um, uh, the board of dean judges or village judges whom he institutes. And he also encourages um, uh, the worship of Athena through the establishment of the, the festival of the great Panathenia. These are all very significant developments and they suggest that he had some interest in stability and these developments strengthen the idea of community and also show that public business uh, doesn't have to be about a, a, a elite competition alone. It can involve new public institutions to, to mediate and direct public life. When Piersostratos died, his two sons Hippias and Hipparchus took over. When Hipparchus was murdered by one of the rival factions, Hippias set out to avenge his brother's death. But unlike his father Piersostratos, Hippias ruled unjustly. The people of Athens rose up and demanded a new leader, a leader that would give them a say in how they were governed. Cleisthenes became the new leader and is regarded as the founder of democracy in ancient Athens. He abolished Solon's four classes and replaced them with ten tribes based on electorates rather than class and named them after great Athenian heroes. Each tribe was in turn divided into ten demis which became the basis of local government. The tribes each elected 50 members to a council called the Boule, which governed Athens on a day-to-day -day basis. The assembly or ecclesia was open to all citizens and provided democratic equality for the people of Athens. At the end of the day, we have democracy in Athens because ordinary people stood up and said, we want a role in the governing of our city. We want to uh, adjudicate the disputes of the upper class. So really there are two players, so to speak, in the history of democracy in ancient Athens. In fact, a system of ostracism was established to keep the balance between these two key players. If the people thought a politician abused their power, they could write their name on a piece of clay called an ostracon. The politician would lose their position and would be exiled from the city for a set amount of time. Pericles, on the other hand, was an Athenian statesman that held his post for over 30 years and he heavily contributed to the democracy in Athens. One of his greatest achievements was the building of the Acropolis. Pericles owed his position really to the, the power of his oratory. Uh, and in fact he is seen as an important figure in Athenian politics in, the, uh, in helping to develop oratory and public speaking uh, as an activity of the democracy. And we have fragments of famous speeches by him uh, which were quoted by people throughout antiquity because of their wit and uh, their powerful rhetoric. I started to make my way up to the Panica Hill where Pericles delivered many of his famous speeches. Thucydides, the great ancient Greek historian who wrote about the 30-year war between Athens and Sparta, transcribed a speech made by Pericles at a funeral procession in which Pericles praises the soldiers for giving up their lives to protect Athens and its democracy. Well, I finally made it to the most important area in ancient Greece for democracy. This is the Pnyx Hill. And just behind me is the Pnyx, or the Pnyka in Greek. It's where all the speakers in Athens addressed the assembly. And this is where the democratic process in Athens happened. On the other side of the hill is the Acropolis, which is the most noticeable landmark and where most of the tourists are today. The fact that the Parthenon and other structures still stand is testament to Pericles' vision to commission the buildings on the Acropolis two and a half thousand years ago. There is no doubt that democracy improved the lives of the citizens of Athens, and it's no coincidence that this period produced a huge amount of human endeavour, but it was far from perfect. Slavery was readily accepted. Women and metics did not have a vote, and some decisions made directly by the masses did not always produce the best outcomes. This is a view shared by the great philosophers Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. Plato was totally against it. Aristotle, although he wrote a great deal about democracy, suggested a mixed government was the ideal form. Aristotle was eventually exiled from Athens, and Socrates, well, he suffered a greater fate. He was sentenced to death by a democratically elected jury for allegedly not worshipping the city gods and corrupting the youth 
by encouraging them to question authority. Regardless, the ancient Greeks left us with much more than just democracy. The Olympic Games, philosophy, science, music, art, architecture, literature, drama, comedy, and a large amount of the English language. But the waging of war eventually took its toll on Athens. The Athenians uh, were able to maintain the democracy for 200 years. Uh, and one reason for that is that they were a reasonably powerful military power throughout the classical period. And as such, they could stop uh, enemies from conquering them and putting down the democracy. However, when they lost that capacity to protect themselves, when they lost the capacity to maintain their independence from military rivals, then their democracy was in trouble. So right at the end of the classical period, in the, the last decades of the fourth century, Athens loses badly to the new kid on the block, the new military power in the Mediterranean, the Macedonians. And as a result, uh, they have to put up with a garrison in their city uh, which uh, polices um, a new political order uh, which is much narrower than democracy. So really at the end of the day it was the inability of the Athenians to uh, stand up or to, to challenge effectively a significant new military power which allowed the overthrow of their democracy by an external power.